Okay, can everybody see my slides okay? Yeah, we've got your slides, yeah. Great. So um, I'm gonna share uh, a project that um, a group of us are working on um, here at BYU. Um, and I want, like, anytime I start these projects, I want to acknowledge the team that we work with. So I'm just one of a, a number of co-authors here. So I, I'm one of the political psychologists on this program. Um, Lisa and Josh are the others. And then we have a, a computer science team that's involved as well. So that would be Alex, Justin Jackson, and David Wingate is sort of the lead computer scientist involved in this. Um, and it is it is an interdisciplinary group effort. So I'm the voice of our team today, but I am no means the one who is in charge. And so um, I want to give them all sort of the same credit as we've worked on this together for many years. So the project I want to share with you today is called AI Enabled Persuasion Research. The title is a little bit different from what I had sent a, a week or so ago. It's the same project. We just, as we can't ever be happy with our titles, we change them a lot, uh, but it is the same project, same substance. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about persuasion and AI and ways that we can use AI to understand persuasion better. Our larger team um, likes to think about what can we use uh, artificial intelligence for to understand the questions that we already have. There's lots of other applications of the things I'll walk you through today, um, but today my focus is on how can this be a tool through which we can understand the dynamics and the, the role that persuasion plays more than we would be able to otherwise. Um, and we start from the position that persuasion is everywhere. Um, I won't spend a long time talking about this, but the persuasion is a big part of human society. We try and persuade each other. We, our physicians try and persuade us to take medications. We try to persuade physicians to listen to us. Um, school boards try and persuade constituents to listen. Constituents try and persuade school boards to change curriculum and school policies. There's persuasion going on around us in the political and non-political sphere. Now, now we are most interested um, our team in the political consequences of this. That's just our orientation and our discipline. We're, we're political psychologists. Um, and more than just an interesting phenomenon for democracy, there are many approaches to democracy that suggest that persuasion is a core feature of it. Some, for example, go so far as to say that democracy is distinguished as a form of governance by the extent of persuasion as opposed to coercion. That comes from a handbook on persuasion and attitude change by some political psychologists. There are others who make similar claims that persuasion is a core element of democracy. Um, and so for us, it's important, not just because it occurs in the world, but also because as we think about the health of democracy, as we think about the nature of democracy in the contemporary political context, persuasion is a part of that. And we think about persuasion, typically we're thinking about one speaker, a sender, sending a message to a receiver and hoping or intending that that message influence or change the attitudes or behavior of the receiver. We could think about different kinds of senders. These can be individuals, they can be organizations, they can be media sources. And then we have also the receiver. The message itself has a lot of characteristics. There's a lot of research in the social sciences about what makes persuasion more or less likely to occur. Um, we have some expectations about what makes different messages persuasive. Two big findings from research um, on this area have to do with what's called customization and then elaboration. And here we draw from business marketing, we draw from social psychology, from political psychology, lots of different fields that care a lot about persuasion. By customization, what we mean is, is the message tailored to you? That can be done in a lot of ways. Sometimes in the context of, of politics, this is called micro-targeting. Um, but just is the message tailored to you as an individual or is it more generic? By elaboration, we mean this in the sort of classic psychology sense of so the elaboration likelihood model, or how much are you engaging with the message? Do you, is it, are you forced to elaborate and engage with it in depth, or is it a more superficial process with low levels of elaboration? These are not the only things that matter. These are two things that we vary in our study. That's why I bring them up now. Uh, but there are two important elements of messages that can influence how persuasive they are. In the pursuit of understanding these and other dynamics, uh, persuasive exchanges are very difficult to study. What I mean by that is it's difficult to observe real conversations. It's difficult to observe real people discussion, discussing with each other. It's not impossible. Some innovative research does this, but it's hard to often observe real discussions with real political or political or other persuasive attempts. It's also hard to isolate single components when we design or craft messages to study in an experimental or research kind of a way. Those messages have lots of features. And their features, some of those we intentionally manipulate, others of those might be different in ways that we didn't expect or intend. Um, there's also idiosync idiosyncrasies of specific messages or centers. That is to say, there's communications research suggesting that the specific message you choose, as opposed to any of a number of alternatives that are similarly structured, is important in influencing persuasion, um, influencing general or communication effects. Um, and it's also difficult to scale personalized content. Now, I'll talk a little bit about what AI helps us to do in this respect. 
But it's difficult to imagine sort of a single research assistant sitting at a computer trying to tailor a message to any of a thousand or two thousand research participants. It's a challenging task. There's some ways to do this mechanically. We're going to talk about the ways that language models help us to do this. Um, but there's lots of components about persuasive exchanges that make them hard to study with traditional social science tools. And there's maybe other tools we focus on social science because of our orientation. We're typically stuck with making a lot of hard choices and wishing we could do some other things that we haven't done. Uh, that's sort of the world we're in often with persuasion research. There's lots of recent research about the role that late large language models, that's what I mean by LLMs. I'm sure many, if not all of you are familiar with that, but I'll say LLMs throughout just from laziness. Like um, lots of research about how LLMs can produce text that's equivalently persuasive as humans. That is to say that it can generate messages that are equally as persuasive as a message generated by a human researcher or a human individual. Um, we're going to use this as a starting place. We don't establish this empirically with our study. We build on these studies that have found that language models can be persuasive. We take a different approach, but this is sort of our beginning starting place. And there's a lot of interest in this now for empirical reasons, technical reasons, and also larger normative reasons about the role that language models might play in persuasion, misinformation, and those kinds of spheres. Um, the big contention that we make in this project is that language models can be a useful tool to study persuasion. And what I mean by this is, again, as I presented to you before, we have a sender and a receiver and a message. But our the thing we're exploring in this message, in this study, is can we replace that sender with a large language model? Can we replace that human with a large language model? And as a result, manipulate it in very fine-grained and controllable ways to allow us to understand persuasion at, at a larger scale or sort of with more elements. We can, for example, treat or, or instruct a large language model to act as a well-trained confederate, um, to give an immediate response, so it's a sort of real-time conversation as opposed to some sort of delayed asynchronous experience, to give uniform source cues, so we know source cues matter, for example. How do we eliminate those entirely or control them entirely? We can do this with large language models. We can also use large language models to send not just one message, but lots of different iterations of the same kind of message in a way that would be challenging to do if we had to construct all these manually by hand. And we can have differences in, in wording variation, but keeping the tone and complexity uniform, we have the same mode of communication for different kinds of persuasive appeals. For example, we can test the effectiveness of a message versus a conversation within the same structure in a study in a way that's not possible without language models. And also we can, again, in these kinds of studies, apply traditional social science methods to do random assignment, to get causal inferences from the effect of different kinds of persuasive tactics, pre and post attitude measurement, and just again, uniform task context. An important part of our studies is trying to say, well, how do we eliminate as many elements of this that we're not interested in as possible? How do we control for or account for those as much as possible? This is our large framework we're approaching this project with. The idea that these large language models can act as a tool to help us understand persuasive strategies and persuasive appeals. To evaluate this or to implement it, um, we conducted two data collections. This is sort of hot off the press, not quite as hot as it was two weeks ago, but we, co we finished collecting about two weeks ago. Um, and we have our results for you from this May study. We did two topics that are relevant in the context of the United States. So not everyone here is from the United States or working in the United States in this moment, but we chose two that were politically salient right now in the United States. And one of these is immigration. And one of them is school curriculums in public schools. These are discussions of lots of debates. They're different issues with different dynamics. We chose them intentionally to have different partisan and political connotations. In each of these samples, we have about, we have 1800 respondents. We do this through the, a vendor called Cloud Research Connect. I can talk to you more about that choice if you're interested in why we chose that particular vendor. Um, and the samples are matched to the US census on a series of demographics and balanced on partisanship because we expect partisanship to co-vary with people's pre-existing attitudes and want to balance that as much as we can. Again, the, the dates of these studies was, again, the first part of May. Um, and the specific language model we use here is GPT-4, um, working within OpenAI. Um, and that's the one that we use in this particular context. Um, in this study, there are four different randomized conditions. So if you're imagining yourself as one of these 1,800 respondents in one of these studies, you're assigned to one of these six conditions. Um, and these same conditions were used in the immigration as opposed to the education study. Um, one of these was a one-shot generic message, and I'll give you some examples of what I mean by this, but just very briefly, that is a message that's created new for every respondent by a language model that's attempting to be as persuasive as possible, but doesn't know anything about the respondent. So it's given some instructions that I can show to you if you're interested. I will show you some details about our prompts in the presentation. Um, but this is, again, a strategy about creating as persuasive a message as possible but without incorporating any customization or personalization. The second... Uh, 
condition is a one shot, that is to say a single message that's micro-targeted, that's customized to the respondent in a way that I'll show you when I show you the prompts, that, that the demographic characteristics of the respondent are fed into the language model and the language model is told to customize based on those characteristics. We then have a direct attempt to persuade that this is just a conversation, imagine yourself sitting down with someone where they're trying to change your mind. And the other is a tactic from psychology called motivational interviewing, which tries to encourage people to change their own minds. It's less direct. It doesn't directly try and introduce new arguments and instead tries to get people to interrogate their own experiences and come up with their own reasons why they maybe should change their mind. We have two control conditions. One of those is static. One of those is just a single message. And one of those is an interactive control. Both of these control conditions um, we've tested them in various ways. The responses to both of them are the same. There's no statistically significant differences. We collapse them for the purposes of illustration here, but we included both as a way to evaluate differences based on single messages as opposed to interactions. In this case, with the control, they interacted with the language model where we're discussing with them board games, as opposed to any of the particular political topics that were involved in the discussion. We integrated the large language model directly into Qualtrics, so it appears just as a survey question. To give you an example of what this might look like, um, in the direct persuasion condition, um, they would be first asked to explain their position. Um, so this is an example of what it might look like if someone was doing it on the phone. They're first asked to explain why they have the position that they already indicated earlier in the survey um, on the topic of immigration. Then the language model responds directly to them, reading both in, in this case, the demographic characteristics and what they've already said. The person is asked to respond to the message. And then there's just a series of messages. Each of these conversations has six turns. You can see the counter at the bottom. What that meant was each, the respondent was asked to reply six times before they could proceed. So there's a discussion in these, in these uh, conversational conditions, the, the motivational interviewing and direct persuasion. The discussion with the language model is built directly into Qualtrics. For those in the static conditions, that is to say the single messages, they just saw a message, were asked to read it and then proceeded. There was no conversation in those conditions. In terms of the outcome variables that we have after the, the treatments, we have attitude change. So respondents were asked their, their positions on a set of immigration questions and a set of education questions, depending on the study. Those were asked pre and post. So we have measures of change, not just sort of overall means. We also have willingness to vote for a candidate who takes an opposing position on, to the respondent. And as a point of clarification, I didn't say clearly, all the messages from the language models are pushing the respondents away from their initial position. So these are all counter attitudinal messages. Um, so they're asked again, their level of support for a candidate that takes up as an opposing view. Um, and then we have this, a measure of what we call democratic reciprocity. This comes from our other published work on language models. This is the, the extent to which you allow other people the freedom to have different ideas than you. It's akin to political tolerance. It's not quite the same. It's more about, are, do you allow other people to have different views and do you recognize other people might have reasons that are different from yours? It's an important idea to deliberative theory of theories of democracy, and we use it as a comparison point to some of the other research in political science and our own work with language models. Because this is a more technical discussion, I'm going to show you perhaps more prompts than I would otherwise. I'm going to walk you through. I'm not going to read this to you. There's a lot here. Um, these prompts are the product of lots of trial and error, as I expect many of you know when you work with large language models. Our process was we had our specific theoretical approach in mind. We worked through uh, uh, various iterations of the prompts. Once we had one that we thought we worked well, we ran it with a pilot of about 50 respondents so that we could observe the behavior of the language model in the conversations and make sure that it was behaving the way that we intended. If it was, we proceeded and collected 1,800 respondents. If it wasn't, which in many cases it wasn't, we went back and restructured did another pilot before proceeding. So we tried to have a sort of a validation step that was separate from our final data collections where we ended up gathering the 1800 respondents. Um, some important characteristics of this prompt. So this is a prompt for the micro-targeting single message. What I mean by this is the respondent would just see one message. In this prompt, the characteristics of the respondent are fed in in this description portion, this highlighted portion. We chose a set of politically and socially important characteristics in the United States. There certainly are other things we could have included. These were the ones that we felt like would be predictive or at least helpful to the language model. Um, there's also the specific position that the language model was uh, being instructed to push the respondent towards that was occurred twice in the prompts to make sure the language model held on to that with all the other instructions. Um, there's also a two-step chain of thought reasoning process here, asking them the first reason and then write a message. This is sometimes more effective in, in getting these kinds of prompts to work well with language models. 
And there's some discussion of what should the tone be and other kinds of formatting instructions. So we wanted the language model to know things and to tailor based on the person's characteristics. We didn't want this to be sort of a creepy big brother experience where the language model said, as a white man from the mountain west of the United States, you really should believe this way. Um, so it is customized, but it, we gave specific instructions so that it would not reveal those demographics as a way to, again, that is more akin to what political micro-targeters would do. They wouldn't explicitly say the things that they were using to target, mostly because people are very unsettled by that, especially in the context of artificial intelligence. And then here, there's a set of very specific strategies we gave the language model to do. Again, this is a product of our interpretation of the research on persuasion, as well as our iterative attempts to get the language model to behave the way that we would like. Um, this is an example of a micro-targeted message. I'm, again, not going to read this. I just present it to you as an example we can go through uh, later if you have questions about it. On the le my left-hand side here, you have the characteristics that were read into the language model. And this is the micro-targeted message from the language model about this is the, the education topic, where it's trying to make a, a persuasive appeal, moving the person away from their initial position that the government should do more to prevent teachers from bringing their own views into the classroom. Uh, and this is that you can see some very specific things here where it says we value robust viewpoints in education. We don't want the government uh, to control what people share. We want more limited government. And that's being connected. That limited government argument is, is a product of the language model, knowing that this respondent is Republican and conservative in the context of the United States. Similarly, we have others where the respondents were quite different, where they have different political existing political viewpoints, a different uh, initial position, and a language model crafts a very different persuasive appeal. It's still a single message, but it's micro-targeted to the respondent, both their political and social characteristics, and makes a different argument to them than it would to this, a different individual with a different existing viewpoint. And I am happy as much time as we want to spend discussing these prompts and examples, I can go back to them. I have them here in my slides because I know they're of interest to many people working with language models, the right way to prompt with different objectives. Um, a very different prompt that we have is our direct persuasive appeal. So this is a one where we're trying to train the language model to be a, a conversation participant and to try and persuade you as it's talking to you directly, no sort of beating around the bush about it, just wants to change your mind. Um, and so here, again, some important characteristics, just like the micro-targeted condition, it also is given the respondent's characteristics. So though it's not crafting a single message, it is sort of nested on top of this idea of customization where it knows things about you, and now it's going to make a direct conversational appeal to you. Um, it's also, again, repeated those same instructions about what position it was to take. Um, this chunk here, starting with the user prompt component, that wasn't shown to the respondent. We just found this was important to help the language model jump right into the conversation and not sort of have some false sort of stuttering and starting at the beginning. This is to, again, gear the language model to know that it was going to start a conversation. So this was fed into, this chunk here at the bottom was fed into the language model before the conversation with the actual participant began. This is meant to be sort of, again, wait, so keep in mind that you're going to do a conversation. This is sort of the background. So it knew exactly how to jump in in the conversation, given the context. We found without this, it was sort of hard for the language model to begin, and it needed some prompting or sort of priming, if you will. Um, there are, again, similar instructions about format and tone. Uh, again, not told to incorporate the respondent's uh, characteristics, but not to mention that explicitly. And here we have a set of specific persuasive strategies that we drew from persuasion research. We found, again, it worked best to give the language model a series of strategies to use. Otherwise, it would sort of get off course and very, do very strange and unhelpful things. Um, and as an example of this, again, I'm going to give you some, some highlights of an example. We can go back to this if you want to see more details. Um, this is an example of the direct persuasion, uh, direct persuasion conversation. So this is the first thing the human respondent actually said. This respondent is a, a woman um, who changed her responses by about one scale point out of out of seven um, on, on the pre and post measures. And so she begins by giving her initial position, um, and then the language model responds, um, and the respondent then replies. The language model sends another response. Um, and there's sort of a back and forth all the way again to the end of this conversation, which I'll leave it up here. You can glance through it if you like, if you want me to go back through. One thing that I will note is respondents were not explicitly told that this was an AI tool. I put AI here so that you can see the different turns. The respondents didn't, weren't explicitly told that. We found pretty uniformly everybody guessed it was AI. Um, because they weren't told it was another person and because of the, the chat tool was responding immediately to them, um, they most people weren't deceived. We didn't try to explicitly deceive them when we have a manipulation check afterwards. Most people guessed that this was an AI chatbot kind of a tool. Um, and, but again, they weren't given these labels. These labels are for you as far as looking at at, at, the, at the presentation here. 
So again, we see the language model replying to the person's pos initial position and also replying to the things that the person is saying in the conversation. It's a brief conversation, not meant to be overly long. Um, and it lasts, again, in every context, lasts six turns before the respondent is allowed to proceed. One of the first things we wanted to do was to decide if the language model had done uh, its job appropriately. What I mean by this is we are, I don't know about other people, but in our team, we're constantly asking ourselves, how will we know if it worked? How will we know if the language model did the thing that we wanted it to do? Um, and this is, again, separate from the actual uh, experimental treatment effects, which I'll show you in a minute. What you're going to see on this is an analysis of the messages sent by the AI tool. So in the conversation conditions, we extracted the human part. That's not a part of this analysis. Just the things that the AI, the AI tool said in every condition. You're going to see different colors with this dark orange is the generic message. That's just a single message. The yellow is the micro-targeted message. The purple is the interact direct persu persuasion appeal. And the green is the motivational interview. What you're going to see on this, this is going to be an embedding space. So there's no intrinsic scale to this. That is to say, there's no numbers to this because this is just a high dimensional space that's then superimposed into two dimensions for presentation purposes. And this is again, based on embeddings of those texts. And one of the things that was reassuring to us is we're seeing distinct clusterings of the of meaning of these messages. I would personally be very concerned if this is just sort of a random scattershot and all the messages were sort of equally spread in different components. And while this doesn't necessarily tell us exactly what the language model is saying in every context, what it's saying is that the language model is using words with different meanings in different conditions. It's using different uh, approaches in its messages in the different treatment conditions that we constructed. This is the immigration uh, analysis. This is the same analysis for K through 12 education. We see a closer in both of these, I'll sort of toggle quickly back and forth. In both of them, we see that the interactive conditions are closer to each other. So purple and green are closer to each other. We would expect that given that it's meant to be a conversation in both cases and there's replying to, to respondents. The orange and yellow are closer to each other than they are to the purple and green. Again, this is a single message with a very similar structure. It's not surprising to see some similarities there. And again, this is a semantic word embedding uh, kind of analysis. And so I, I can't give you too more detail about sort of what does an exact distance mean. These are, again, word embeddings that don't have an intuitive scale to them. Uh, but it's, again, all the AI conversations put in together to see what is the content of those. And is it really producing different kinds of messages based on our conditions and our instructions? Um, our next question was, okay, well, it may pr be producing different arguments or different approaches or different kinds of statements, uh, but are those persuasive appeals, uh, are they actually persuasive? Um, and so uh, we used a three-item scale. Uh, this is asked before and after, so what I'm going to show you is change in attitudes. Um, and in both cases, it's going to be changing attitudes about the topic of the conversation. So the first study was immigration, and the second study was the regulation of curriculum in K through 12 schools. And the graph I'm going to show you, positive values indicate directions, movement in the direction of the treatment, so more persuasion. And negative values mean sort of a, ba a backlash. That would mean that someone re responded to the message by saying, no, I feel even more strongly about what I already thought, as opposed to changing my mind. And the baseline for these graphs I'm going to show you is both of the control conditions combined. We combine them together because as we as we planned in our pre-analysis plan, we, would, we evaluated if they were different from each other. They weren't. And so we collapse them for the ease of presentation and frankly, also to reduce the number of tests we need to conduct. Um, this is the graph I'm about to show you. You're going to see the treatment effects, the persuasive effect of each of these appeals. The so one shot generic single message, one shot micro target single message and these two conversations. And what we observe, again, the two colors, green is the immigration study, uh, purple is a K through 12 study. We observe that most of these messages work most of the time. So we're seeing persuasive effects, attitude change. The one case where we're not observing this would be with the motivational interviewing on immigration. And that effect is weaker um, in the K through 12 than some of the other strategies. But one of the conclusions that we reach from this is these persuasive appeals shift people's attitudes. As some research, again, recent research in political psychology and other sort of communications would suggest that if you try and persuade someone, you usually can, at least a little. Um, especially when in this case where we have removed like group-based cues, partisanship, that's not a part of this discussion. Um, but that we don't really see big differences based on customization. So for example, the difference between one-shot generic and one-shot micro-target is typically small, maybe significant, but in terms of absolute size, not that different. We're not seeing big differences for the interaction conditions. So the level of elaboration where you're forced to talk through with someone, we're just sort of seeing a uniform effect. Uniform is perhaps the wrong word to use, but a very similar effect in all the different persuasive appeals. Um, when we look at people's willingness to vote for a candidate, 
that has the position that the language model was arguing for, we see, again, uh, a persuasive appeal in the sense of making people more likely to support a political candidate with the views that the language model was trying to push them towards. Again, motivational interviewing is the one that's weakest on immigration. That's the one where we see weaker effects on K-12 in some circumstances as well. But the general pattern here is a persuasive effect in the direction of the treatment. And again, but again, we're not seeing big differences based on customization and elaboration. They all have a, a, a very similarly sized effect. We're not seeing big differences based on the things that might we might have guessed were important based on the existing research and persuasion. We also considered um, democratic reciprocity. This is a four item index that we have used before. And the reason we included this was we are very interested as political psychologists in understanding, can you effectively persuade someone and also create more democratic reciprocity or more understanding or are those goals antithetical? If I persuade you, if my goal is to persuade you, I might be successful, but maybe I make you more upset about people you disagree with. That may or may not be the case, but one of our objectives was to think about not just persuasion in isolation, but how persuasion relates to other things that are important from a polarization or divisiveness or conflict kind of context. And so uh, we wanted to consider this as well. And when we look at this graph, we're seeing much more weaker conditional effects, maybe only in one or two conditions do we see more democratic reciprocity. There's good news and bad news from this. The good news is that sometimes persuasion can produce larger democratic benefits. I say democratic with a lowercase d in the context of a democratic health. In the context of the K through 12 education and the two interaction conditions, there was an increase in democratic reciprocity for the one-shot messages and neither study was there. Uh, the bad news was that there's lots of persuasion here that's not leading to democratic reciprocity. So if our focus is on changing people's mind, and especially if we want to scale up those interventions using artificial intelligence, we might succeed in that goal, but leave the larger political problems that underlie our, our, our divisions and conflicts unchanged. Especially if we think about the one-shot approaches, which are much easier to scale up, much easier to conduct and construct. Those strategies will persuade people, according to the research that we have here, but they're not going to make people better democratic citizens um, in the way that the interact some of the interaction conditions might. In terms of wrapping up then, um, we find that large language models can be persuasive in a way that, again, recent research uh, on communications and political conversations would suggest that language models can be useful tools for researchers that want to study persuasion, especially in the context of politics, but that we find little evidence for either customization or elaboration, that those are significant factors in increasing political persuasion. Um, we also find that persuasion is not a guaranteed solution to political polarization and conflict. It can sometimes it can sometimes improve democratic health. In many circumstances, it does not. Um, and there's a number of limitations from our studies, things we're actively thinking about how to build and, and extend beyond what we've done. We know that interacting with a language model is not the same as interacting with a human. Other people's excellent research on this topic show that when people know they're inter interacting with a, an AI or a large language model, the response is different or more muted. They feel less happy or less satisfied with it. So it might be the case um, that if we actually pose this as a real conversation or structured in a way where it felt more like a real conversation, um, we might observe even larger effects. That's unknown. We haven't tested that. That's some of the things that we're thinking about. But we know that it matters. We know how you think about what you're interacting with, whether or not it's a person or a tool or a chatbot, um, has an influence on in how you respond to that experience. Thanks. That's it for my pre-prepared presentation. I'm happy to talk and take questions. I'm happy to go through whatever technical details you want to see. I have a bunch of extra slides. I have our whole appendix pulled up on the other screen. So anything and everything is all fair game. Um, and we are happy to talk now about this. Our team is always happy to talk with other people interested in doing other things one-on-one. -on -one. So please um, ask your questions as well. If there's anything I can do in the future, if you're working on something similar, we are happy to discuss and show what we've done and help other people do the same kinds of things if it's of interest to you. Thank you very much, Ethan. That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, and the details on the prompts, that was that was incredible. That was that was really well developed um prompting based on based on my experience of having to do this. Uh if folks have questions, feel free to raise your hand. Um maybe just to get people started. Uh, your results are, are shockingly large. Um I was I was shocked at the magnitudes that you were finding. Yeah. Uh, if I was a political party and I've got an election coming up in November, then obviously I'm putting a lot of resources behind this sort of stuff. Um, do you sort of see that? Uh, what, where, yeah. where do you see that? Yes. Yeah. So I agree with you. I, I typically assume that most of my attempts to persuade people's minds will fail hmm. um, as an individual. Like, um, And so part of the reason why we think, uh, I have two quick responses to that. The first thing I would say is this is sort of um, a very idealized circumstance where you're talking with someone, but they're not explicitly trying to argue from a partisan view. 
We're also persuading people on specific political topics as opposed to like, should you vote for in the United States, Donald Trump or Joe Biden? That will be a harder task. It's a more complicated evaluation with more group identity baked into it. I'm not saying there's not identity in the issues that we chose, but we had a narrower set of views that I think is more manageable. I mean, it is akin to like, there was a recent a book that was just been published about persuasion by Alex Kapuk um, that finds magnitudes that's essentially the same as what we're observing here. And again, the key point that he raises that we sort of lean on is that persuasion is possible in these magnitudes if it's divorced from group-based cues. Once you start adding in identity, it changes the dynamics. Persuasion is often harder. And it would be an interesting thing to explore uh, to see what happens if we actually told the language model to say it was a Republican or to explicitly call somebody out with respect to their partisanship. And it would expect that in the context of the United States, that persuasion there would be much harder. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Uh Shabak? Yeah, thanks, Ethan, for a really, really interesting um, presentation. Really um, fascinating results. I, I, I have some cool, like kind of like survey design specific questions um, yep. to you in particular. One, so so if I understood correctly, is the is the to the extent that you could even call it a survey, it seems more like a conversation or like a chat than a, than kind of a standard survey. So is everything open end, or did you have? Um, did you have like for the agreement disagreement phase, for example, did you have yeah. like a scale or like a binary yeah. question? There? Yeah. And still, like, you know, you can imagine some trade-offs in like, for example, detecting agreement, right? Like, is there error error in that? And so I, mean, I guess I'm just curious and in, in think, you know, just to hear about like, you're thinking yeah. about the structuring of, of the conversation. Yes. Yeah, that's a really important point. So let me clarify that because I wasn't clear about those details and I'm glad you brought that up. So uh, I would call this a survey experiment in the sense that there is a set of traditional survey style questions before the language model experience. And then there's a set of traditional survey style questions after language model experience. It's all housed in the same qualified survey. So people aren't leaving a platform and coming back. We've done it before. It's sort of a logistical nightmare to get people to leave and come back. Um, so in this case, it's all occurring within Qualtrics, but there's this chunk in the middle that's based on a bunch of customization with JavaScript. That is a bunch of open-ended questions for the conversation experiences, for the one-shot messages, it's just a single message they're presented with. But on either side of that, so if you think about this as a sandwich, the sort of two bread parts on the other side are sort of Likert-style questions. They're asking people agree and disagree on immigration, on a willingness to vote for a candidate, and on agreement with these statements about democratic reciprocity. I, I think it would be, um, I would be very interested in, in trying to observe or detect or think about persuasion when we ask people to just articulate their view before and after in their own words. Um, that isn't what we've done. Um, so I can't speak directly to, well, uh, you know, uh, how might that be different from what we observe? What we do have that we haven't considered is we do have their initial position. We ask them to explain it, um, at least in the conversation experiences. And we would we could try to explore how that position shifts through the course of the conversation. It's a little tricky because at the end, we don't ask them to sort of restate their final position. Uh, but we do have their initial statement in their own words. And we could try and trace how do their messages sort of begin to diverge from that either in meaning or linguistic features. That isn't what we've done um, so far. Um, and I think it would be fascinating to try and explore an alternative measurement for if we want to observe persuasion, is the right way to do that within this more rigid multiple choice kind of question? Or is it better to observe it with a more free forum before and after just state your position? Um, and I don't know what, how the results might differ. And perhaps you have better priors than I do about that. But I would expect there would be differences. I'm just not quite sure what they might be. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. And and I should just mention that we at NORC are kind of working on stuff related to the integration of AI and survey. So I'd love to follow follow up with you a little bit more on, on these and related topics. I guess just one other question, um, if I may. Um, I'm curious about like satisficing and whether you think there, there'd be more or less satisficing in, in this sort of setup than, than otherwise. Because you can imagine... The respondent kind of feeling cornered, right, with an extremely pers you know persuasive sounding, long kind of like thorough everything in the kitchen sink thrown in type message, and you know they they respond with it just like an I agree or something like that, right? So curious if you saw any instances of satisfying or or if you didn't, like how you would how you would detect that in this sort of setup? Yeah, that's a great question. So I don't know that we've explored satisfying directly enough. Let me first say something about before I forget, about the integration of this in the context of surveys. So I we would love to talk to you more about that if you're interested. David Wingate, the one who designed the programming component, he posted this on a Qualtrics community forum. Anybody can see his code about how he 
put the language model directly into Qualtrics. So he may not be using Qualtrics, but his JavaScript about how to do that, which to be frank, would be impossible for me to construct on my own. He's just put that out as part of the, the Qualtrics community forum so other people can use it or look at it as much as they want. And I can point people to those resources if that's of interest. In terms of satisficing, um, let me tell you the thing that we've done and then the things we haven't done that would also be perhaps more equally interesting. So uh, one of the things we did initially, we, we found some satisficing, frankly, from interestingly enough, from the language models before we got the prompts right. So language models would sometimes default to be like, okay, we both agree. And then the conversation would result, would sort of devolve into, okay, yes, or okay, thanks. Or it would sort of end in like a very non-meaningful conversation because the language model just kind of gave up um, pretty easily. And so we worked through those and produced prompts that we are fairly confident didn't give up on persuasion, even if it was hard, and didn't devolve into just everybody agrees, sort of the tendency of these models to try and be polite and agreeable um, we, we worked pretty hard to sort of move that out of the model or at least restrain it so it didn't give up so easily. Um, that's on the language model side. Um, on the participant side, um, we haven't directly considered satisficing in terms of like their responses to either the conversation um, or the uh, the follow-up questions themselves. Like um, I, I would expect more satisficing in the conversational treatments uh, in the sense of maybe I'm wrong about this, but it's a more involved experience where you're asked to do more. So if they're going to satisfy us, I would expect it to happen more in those experiences as opposed to when you're just shown a single message. We're not seeing um, uh, severely different treatment effects, but maybe if we could get people to satisfy us less, the treatment effects would be larger for the conversations. That would be an interesting thing to try like and incentivize people to engage with those conversations more. And one thing we can do that we're working on presently is digging deeper into the text of the conversations themselves. So we don't have a lot of information for you right now about sort of how do different, how do the human responses differ in the different treatment conditions. The graph that I showed you was how the language models messages differed. We're working now to sort of analyze the text of what people said and would have more insights about like, are we seeing a bunch of like sort of, oh, well, okay, or I don't have anything to say, or let's just move on kind of responses from the respondents. Our impression from reading through many examples of this is that there's not a lot of that, given that this is relatively short. Um, these are again, uh, six turn conversations. That's not nothing, but it's also not like a 15 minute conversation. It's more like a couple of minutes at most. Um, and so I, I think we can and should think more about that. I don't have great answers other than there's some things that we can do to explore that. And it, it will be interesting to consider how the effects of the conversations were, to, if they would be stronger, if we did some things to incentivize responses or try to reduce satisficing in some other way. Super interesting, thank you. And I'd love to follow up offline. Yeah, please. Samra? Okay, great. Uh, hi, Ethan, this was a great presentation. I should say that I also have some work uh, that's ongoing that's using Ella and as well in, in a similar format as you. So I'm very familiar with uh, the flow that you have going on here. Uh, I have two quick questions. Uh, the first is that I'm not sure maybe I missed it, but in the prompt that you have just before uh, they have the chat um, with the AI, what do you say that they have the chat with? Like, why would you, um, I think in the presentation, you seem to suggest that they did not know, although retrospectively, they were able to guess that they were having uh, a conversation with the AI. I'm wondering uh, who they thought, like, what was the prompt of just what, what was the prompt right before they had the chat? And what is the motivation not to tell them up front that it is a chat that they're having with the AI? So oh, let me just make sure I'm clear. When you say prompt, you're, you're actually thinking about prompt in the context of what are the people told, not what the model is told before the conversation. Right, what are the people up. told? So just yeah. before they have the conversation, yeah. I assume that there is some sort of text mm -hmm. that you have. Yep. Um, it's pretty generic. It says you're going to receive some messages and ask to sort of have a discussion. It doesn't say who with. Um, it was not, one of the things we were trying to avoid was prompting strong things either way with respect to who the person was, them trying to guess if it was another participant or not, um, as well as like, uh, we didn't want to directly suggest it was AI just based on um, the research that we had read about how people react differently if they know it's an AI tool. In retrospect, maybe we didn't need to do that. Maybe we didn't need to sort of be um, unclear about that. We didn't say it wasn't AI, but we also didn't say it was. Um, so who did they think, like what did the text say in terms of you're just going to have a conversation? Yep. Yep. Didn't say seemed... who they would have the conversation with. Nope. 
Um, okay. And uh, they, most of them, so after the, after the treatment experience was over, we had them state who they thought they were talking to. Um, and 70 to 80% of the ones in the chat condition said a chat bot, as opposed to like another person. Got um, it. And so I, I think that um, we were uncertain um, what people would bring into it if we told them directly at the beginning, this is an AI tool, especially with respect to persuasion. We were concerned that people might respond differently with respect to persuasion. Now, in retrospect, maybe we didn't need to worry about that. The one thing I will say say about this is we do have a, a post-treatment question about how concerned they are about AI and the sort of how it's going to change society and things. And the treatment effects are smaller for people that say they're worried about AI. Right. Um, okay. And they're larger for people that say they're either not concerned or pretty excited about AI. Um, and so I, I, in terms of what we might do in terms of moving forward, I'm not sure what I, what I would want to do in terms of if it would be better. I'd be interested in your thoughts if you think it would be better to have a to be more direct about it, we were just a little concerned about what they might bring in if we directly told them it was a. And we also, in all these studies, we've tried to avoid deception as much as we can, right. and so we didn't want to present it as a person. Um, and so we chose for this middle ground, which was neither thing. And I'm it, 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 there may be a better approach to that, and I, and I would be totally open to that if you feel like or you think from your experience it'd be better to be more explicit. So we we do tell them that it is an AI, but. From your presentation, I think it might be an interesting methods kind of contribution to do both, uh, yeah. sort of an experiment. Uh, yeah. In the beginning, tell half of the respondents that it's an AI. Yeah. The other half, maybe, as you suggest, uh, yeah. have it a little bit open-ended and see if it does have yeah. an effect. And if it doesn't, uh, then maybe being open uh, mm -hmm. would be the right way to do it. Um, yeah. But in our case, we do tell them that they are having yeah. a chat with the AI. We also have uh, uh, the six back and forths, which is kind of nice to see that you have that as well. Uh, it's reassuring uh, because initially when we were doing the pilot and we didn't have that, people were going really quickly. There would be mm -hmm. one exchange and then they'd yep. move on. And so yep. I suspect you had similar um, mm -hmm. reasoning to, to have six. I, I'm just happy to see that we came around the same number. Um, yep. The question I, I, I have is if you have any interest or desire uh, to looking at whether your effects have long lasting um, impact uh, or because you're just measuring it right yep. away. Uh, yep. It's not a panel. Um, yep. I suspect you're going to do more of this. So I'm wondering if you are thinking of doing something like that, given the effect size that you have. Yeah, I think so. I, we're certainly interested to think about the durability of the persuasive effects. Uh, my reading of persuasion research in political science and communications generally is that we would expect it to decay. Um, I would right. not expect this to be super long lasting. We haven't established that. We have done in some, one of our other papers that we published, we did some over time. And to be frank, the reason we didn't include that was we were already concerned about the logistical complexity of what we had done. Like, um, and we didn't want to add that on not knowing how well this would work. Um and so I, I definitely think we're interested in durability and we're interested in, in um, tracing how, how much does it decay. In our particular case, again, this is maybe more insider baseball than you would like, but when we were thinking about what we want to do after the first study, the immigration study, we felt like the next most important thing was to establish that it was effective across different topics. Um, and that was more important to us at the time than, than durability. But having done it, and there's other topics we could also pursue and should think about, but having done that, I think we're more interested in thinking about durability now uh, I was not certain, and many of us on the team were not certain, is this going to work the same way in a completely different topic? Um, and we were reassured that it seemed to. Um, but that's when, when we were prioritizing what to do after the immigration study, we sort of moved over to a different topic. And again, maybe that's a level of detail that's not interesting, but that was why we chose to do it that way instead of prioritizing, di prioritizing durability. But I would not expect, from our previous experience or just my read of the research on persuasion, that these effects would be sort of very durable across a long period of time. I could be wrong. Like, um, but my experience with these kinds of treatments is that there is an initial effect and it tends to decay over the period of a couple of weeks. Great. That's all I have. I'll talk to you offline about. Great. The Please stuff. do. Thanks so much. Uh, there, does anyone else have any other questions? Feel free to raise your hand. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Th thanks for that talk, Ethan. It was really interesting. Um, so two questions for you. One, alluding to what Rohan mentioned do you think that like the dnc or the rnc would ever reach out to you guys or like are there other consulting companies that are going to try to move into this space that's part one and part two which is thinking about this from like a red teaming perspective 
to the comment, even if the effects are, they last for 24 hours, that's not big. But if the, if the vote happens the next day, that's a big effect, so to speak. Could an academic ever pass like a, like the, the university screening protocol by actually trying to use their model in a randomized control sense of saying, can you actually swing a school board election or something like that? Like, because I, I mean, if academics don't do it, like the not for profit, well, the, whatever, you know what I'm saying? The special interest groups will instead try to mobilize it themselves. I'm just curious if you have any thoughts about yeah. those aspects. I have lots of thoughts about them. So I'm, this is, it's sort of ironic that uh, I won't do too much of an aside, but it's ironic that I'm a part of this team because I'm so worried about AI generally. Like if I answer that question, I would say that I'm very concerned about AI as opposed to excited. Like, um, and so uh, in reverse order, I, I mean, I think that most academic institutions would not approve that from an IRB ethical perspective. Um, given some recent controversies, relatively recent anyway, um, I think that they would be very sort of wary of that. Um, I think that the point you raise is an interesting and important one. So every time I go to my computer science colleagues and I say, should we really be doing this? Like, is this, could this be sort of twisted in a way that we don't anticipate? Most of the time they respond to me and say things like, if you don't think that malicious actors are already doing this, you're being kind of naive about how people are implementing these tools. And it's important for us to explore their positive uses in addition to the negative uses that are being considered. I don't know that I'm fully persuaded by the argument. It makes me feel a little bit better, I guess. But I don't know that an academic IRB would be persuaded by that kind of logic. Like, um, And so I do think that there will be an asymmetry in terms of uh, special interest groups, parties, political organizations that would be interested in implementing this kind of thing. Um, and there will be an asymmetry in terms of how well do we understand it in the context of an actual election. Um, um, I don't know the right way that I could try and get that through an IRB, but I think they would be very skeptical based on my previous experience. Like it would be very difficult, if not impossible. Um, in terms of, I, we haven't had any uh, sort of parties or organizations reach out to us yet. Um, I generally think that it takes a while for um, people to pay attention to academic research because of how we're siloed. Like um, we have on some of our other research that deals with like improving divisive conversations, we've had a number of like Facebook or Meta rather and, and Google and Nextdoor were very interested in the work that we did. Nextdoor actually used it in something that they implemented. Um, I, I would be, I think there might be some interest. I think there is a lot of interest solely from the academic side. There are a lot of research people moving right in this moment to consider the persuasive effects of AI. Lots of it, like lots of really great, interesting, exciting stuff going on. And so I think that there probably is a parallel interest. I'm a little unaware of what exactly that is and how much that's interfacing with academic research. Um, I think there's a lot that would be relevant. And I expect if someone wanted to talk to us, we'd be happy to chat with them. We didn't necessarily design this with like a particular party or cause in mind. Um, but I think there's a lot of very clear implications. Like if you want to change people's attitudes on some policy or policy discussion or right before an election when an issue is really salient, this is suggesting there can be some very real effects. Like um, the only thing that I will add as a caveat to that is that like all social science research, there is this process of opting into the study. And there's a process of opting in and people know they might have a discussion. They're not told they will, they're told they might. Like, And there's a set of people for whom that possibility alone is enough to dissuade them from taking the study. Um, and I don't know how those people would respond to these kinds of treatments. Um, and those people are obviously politically, they can be politically active. Like. Um, and I don't know that we wish this would carry over to those contexts. I don't have a reason to think it wouldn't work, but I always worry about that. What are the real populations that are not engaging the research process that I don't know as much about? Yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, I, I forgot what they were called in the U.S. IRBs, as you say. Yeah, IRBs. Yeah. Um, yeah OK, so hearing you say that makes sense. Like two things that popped into my mind. Was, like one would just be, yeah, like. You know, can you basically have these AI focus groups, right? Can you use the text from your conversation so that you can kind of like tailor your message to like a representative housewife yeah. of Indiana or something, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then the other thing I thought of too was like Cambridge Analytica. Like I could imagine a lot of grifty people going into this just, you know, because if the Biden campaign has a couple hundred million dollars to spend and you offer them a service for $250,000, that's a rounding error. They don't care. It's like, ah, oh, maybe yeah. we'll work. I don't know. We'll do it. Sure. Like sure. try your AI thing. Or, you know, you, you have an ad, you click the ad, like mm -hmm. click here to find out why Trump was, the jury was rigged. You click mm -hmm. it and then you just chat with a chat bot who's been like yeah. primed to like convince, I don't know, just thinking like lots of, lots of fun, uh, scary ways you can imagine. Yeah. yeah. I think that's certainly possible. And one of the things that, so I'm both reassured and not reassured by our finding. I'm reassured in the sense that we're not seeing, one of the big concerns that I see from the research on, on IAI and persuasion is this, is it going to be sort of a super micro-targeter? That is to say, it can give you such a tailored message 
that you're going to be so persuaded and bowled over by it. We're not really seeing evidence of that. We're seeing that it's persuasive, but that the micro-targeting itself or the customization is not the thing that seems to be making a lot of movement here. Um, in many cases, it's the same as the generic message. It's not more persuasive. It's not less persuasive. It's just not more. So that sort of uh, sort of reassures me a little that we're, that this sort of this sort of really intense micro-targeting may not be the sort of silver bullet many people are looking for. But the thing I remain concerned about is just the idea that the language model can be used to generate you know as many arguments as you could imagine, like and and deploy them at scale. Like is certainly something that can and is being done. Like I imagine, I guess I don't know. I don't have insight into the campaigns. I'd be surprised if there are no political causes and political groups that are that are doing this. I would guess many of them are interested in it. Like, um, and so the the fact that this shows that these messages can be persuasive and that they can be scaled, even if the customization is not the scary thing, the scaling is a thing that often makes me concerned about. Like this language model can create like a hundred thousand messages in a way that would be almost impossible to do before the advent of these kind of tools. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Yeah, really great talk. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. uh, does anyone else have any other questions? Ethan, maybe just brief. Oh, sorry, Eric, did you? No. Uh, Ethan, maybe just briefly, could you talk a little bit of some of the challenges of having performant code here? So you've got your LLMs, you've got to deal with your survey provider, um, Qualtrics, you've got humans. Um, what were some of the challenges that you faced sort of like hooking it all up? And... Yeah. So one of the challenges that I always worry about here is um, most of these language models are not static. Like the prompts that work today, if OpenAI or Google or any of the people that create the proprietary models change something, the models may not work anymore, even though the prompts are the same. And we've had this experience with some of our other studies that we've tried to move on to different, tried to apply again or sort of run in a different way and then the models have changed and they don't work the same way anymore. Um, we tried to do this, all of that meant was we developed the prompts and tried to launch like immediately before there was any sort of change to the underlying model. The, another way around that would be to use some of the open source models. We've considered those, but they typically have not performed as well at the task we want them to do. Um, and so we've, we've stuck pretty closely, not always, but pretty closely with the open AI model. So one of the difficulties logistically is like, how do we time this in a way where we know the prompts are gonna continue to work? Um, and we're not concerned about it, OpenAI suddenly changes something and now the prompts using even the same, it's just a different version of the same model. I'm not even talking about GPT-40 or GPT-4 or GPT-4 Turbo, any of that stuff. Like, um, so um, the one of the other, we are always worried when we sort of try to launch this on with a survey provider is, is the task going to be so strange or complicated that we're just not going to have a lot of drop off or people are going to take the study so we want to have real conversations, but if you make that too burdensome, the people on these are, these survey platforms are just not going to take it. And so we had to juggle. I would have loved for a longer conversation. We chose six. Um, I'm glad other people have also chose six. We chose six because it was sort of more than one message, but not so long that we were we'd scare people off. In an ideal world, we'd have, I would prefer more like 10 or 12, but that's kind of long for many of these survey providers. And they're going to be hard to get, recruit people for that. Um, uh, there is also the level of sort of integration with this with the Qualtrics platform, and there are other platforms besides Qualtrics that people are using to do language models things, and that's there's some advantages to those. Most of our data collections have been in Qualtrics, so we kept it on that platform. But all that I can say about those logistical difficulties is it was wonderful to have computer scientists on the team because it would have taken me a whole lot longer and it would have been a whole lot worse to have me coded in JavaScript than it would be to have a computer scientist program it. Um, and again, that specific code, I'd, I'd be happy to share with anyone who's interested. Um, David Wingate, again, has posted that so other people can use it. And we've modified it, but it's essentially just a series of API calls that occur in the JavaScript that goes that's behind the question in Qualtrics. Um, and I initially was like, well, I don't know how we would do this. Do we have to move people off platform to do this? We've done that before. It's just hard. And to me, that was a nice way to resolve some of the log logistical problems and say, let's all keep it in one seamless experience, which you can do. It just requires some JavaScript programming that um, you have to, or or requires a different kind of custom survey interface that you design for other purposes. Um, so I think we try to minimize the number of steps that people completed, and that made it harder on our end, but I think better from the participants' uh, perspective. Um, I don't know if there's other specific questions you had in mind when you asked it. Those are things that come to me in terms of mind about logistics. Um, I think the piloting was especially important here mostly because we developed the prompts, we tested the prompts ourselves, but we also wanted to let it run 50, 100 times um, and then actually be able to look at them. 
um, and make sure that they were working when they were tested out on real people, as opposed to us just sort of playing around in the, in the sandbox or the playground features of these open AI or other tools. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so maybe just briefly, um, Semra is just asking uh, about some guidance on the on where the code is. Sure. Uh, in terms of where to find it or where it is in the Qualtics survey? Uh, I think you're asking about where to find it. Would that be right, Semra? Yeah. Yeah, let me see if I can find it. I have a link to it. I'm, you're all seeing my email now. I guess I could stop sharing my screen. Um, I have, I've sent it to people before. I can find it. It's just a, it's a community help forum for Qualtrics. Um, let me see if I can find the link. If I can't, I'll send it to Rohan or you certainly are welcome to contact me. Um, I have it. Um, I think that he put it on like a community page for, for people working with JavaScript in Qualtrics. But let me find, see if I can find it quickly. If I can, I'll put it in the chat. Um, let's see. Yeah, I found it. And a, a rare lucky circumstance, I found it on the first attempt. It almost <laughs> never happens to me. Um, but here's the link um, to the way that he integrated it in Qualtrics. There are other ways that other people have done. Um, and you certainly don't have to follow all of his code, but this is the code that he used um, to integrate this into uh, Qualtrics. Um, again, his name is David Wingate. He gets all the credit for doing this, he and his students. It's certainly beyond my JavaScript coding capacities. So like, um, and I'd be happy to talk, anybody that wants to talk more about how we do that, that component of it, I'd be happy to chat with you about it. If I don't know the answers, I can connect you to David or other people on our team that are more sort of in, more involved in the actual um, integration of the AI tools with Qualtrics. But that link will take you to his code that he posted. Excellent. Well, uh, we're at one o'clock. Uh, so um, with that, I might just say thank you very much again for a fantastic presentation. And it's really nice to sort of be, I feel like I'm up on the edge now of political science or research. <laughs> Up to date. Thank you, Marosheath, and have a nice rest of the day, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.